OK, we're turning our attention back to rugby and I'm delighted to say our guest, our final guest on the show this morning is David Irwin, former Ireland and uh, Lion Rugby International. Uh, David, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. Not too bad, lads. Um, you? it, your name came back into the public's consciousness as the Six Nations campaign rolled on and the players began to just speak about the the fact that yourself and, and Brian O'Driscoll and Craig Doyle were in talking and Paul Rouse were in talking about... Ireland's call and how the team is a very unusual thing in Irish cultural life. Um, can you can I spool you back to the bit where you got invited in? How did that come about? Uh, well, initially it actually occurred about eighteen months ago, nearly two years ago. Uh, I think Andy Farrell had watched uh, Craig and Brian's documentary Shoulder to Shoulder and thought that it really hit a note in terms of. Uh, you know, getting the guys to think about, you know, Ireland's call in particular and what players over the years had gone through to play for Ireland, particularly during the, the Troubles up north. So Andy Farrell was very keen. In fact, he got the whole team to watch it about maybe 18 months ago. And then there was a couple of dates set to actually have that meeting. And then because of COVID, it was postponed several times. Maybe fortunately in the end, because ultimately it was uh, we had it the Monday leading into the, the French game. So it was sort of Andy Farrell's idea, I think, initially. Uh, and so I was delighted to go in with, with Brian and Craig and, and Paul, obviously, and uh, sort of discuss the documentary and, and some of the topics around it. Um, did you have a plan about what you were going to say? Because 18 months of stewing on, actually, I need to say something that's going to be interesting here to a, you know, a, a bunch of a, a different generation. And also, I need to make sure that I catch it, the note right, particularly the week of a game against France. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I didn't really have any preparation for it. I mean, I just sort of spoke from within, from the heart, so to speak. I, I was slightly worried because I knew Paul Ruse was speaking first, and he's obviously a professor of Irish history in UCD, and I thought, Jeepers, I, I, my Irish history is maybe not particularly strong because we, we don't get taught Irish history up here, or certainly I didn't. So I, I actually got a few books out and read a bit, but I, I was relieved when we arrived at the meeting that, that Brian O'Driscoll was equally as nervous about any Irish history because he didn't speak so much about it either. But I mean, it wasn't that type of talk. It was more the history of Irish rugby that Paul was sort of reflecting on, and particularly the fact that, you know, in partition 100 years ago, rugby was one of the the sports that stuck to an all-Ireland sort of uh, basis in terms of the team. It didn't split into north and south and so on. So we'll Paul gave a bit of that sort of background history and uh, so I sort of got off scot free in terms of any other Irish history. I'm sure the, the talk, David, had a significant impact for the for the players not born maybe within Ireland who weren't aware of some of the history, the likes of, of Bundy Aki and, and Mac Hansen and, and Rob Herring. Um, James, the likes of... The sort of what you might call the overseas players that play in the Irish yes. team. I think, you know, it probably meant less to them although I think they were still very intrigued and, and interested in, to, to listen to what what we were saying but also what some of his fellow players were saying I mean Johnny Sexton and James Ryan in particular were quite involved in the discussion and I think you I mean most of the players in the room were sort of similar age to my kids and gladly my kids and, and obviously the players in the room didn't know an awful lot about the troubles uh, because it wasn't a particularly pleasant time to be living through so uh, they, they got a bit of an idea obviously from watching the documentary but clearly I suppose I gave them a wee bit more insight into what it was like playing rugby for both Ulster and Ireland at that time It's funny because some of the players I mean all of the players sing Ireland's call every week but uh, before a game but they probably didn't didn't realise the background to it and when it was brought in in, in 95 that it was brought in for a reason, to be more inclusive. So I'm sure that was something that, that a lot of players picked yeah. up on as well. I mean, I think probably initially some of the players within the Irish setup sort of felt that the shoulder to shoulder was a bit intrusive on their, on their own sort of national anthem as such. But if you actually take time to sort of listen to the words and sort of think about it, it obviously makes a lot more sense. And clearly it is very inclusive. I mean, you know, a lot of the words in it are, although people just sing them and enjoy the crack of the song I mean you know you know together standing tall and shoulder to shoulder in the four proud provinces of Ireland you know it is quite powerful in terms of mo motivation and making you realize you know sort of I suppose where we've all come from and, and we're all working together and we're much more powerful and much more strong working together 
And obviously in the context of the talk we did, obviously a bit more insight into what, say, players in the past, not just me, but quite a lot of different people have had to go through in terms of even just training for Ireland or representing Ireland and some of the risks that people had to take, particularly some guys that maybe were in the security forces at the time and so on. Uh, it, it's obviously such a, a long and important section of Irish rugby life. There was another documentary on after the England game about when England did come over, I think it was 72 and the, the Troubles yeah. were at their absolute height. And, um, you know, the English Rugby Union, they showed up, the, the Welsh and the Scottish didn't come for that game. And I think yeah. maybe sometimes we forget that when the, the rivalry is as intense as it is. I guess that was the 70s. Your part of the story is, is actually the 1980s and the build-up to the World Cup in 1987, which is supposed to be this uh, global outpouring of rugby crossing into the mainstream for the first time that um, the whole world comes together. And I, I think people are generally familiar with your story, but I'd, I'd say that a lot of people are still discovering it for the first time. Did you talk in detail about what actually happened in 1987 to the team? Yeah, talk, talked a bit about it. I mean, Craig had a few clips of the documentary, one of which was obviously the, the bomb event at Killeen at the border. Uh, but probably majority of them didn't really know much detail about what had actually happened. I mean, clearly it's the sort of thing that you could spend a long time talking about. But yeah, I did go into a bit of detail about, as you say, it was the first Rugby World Cup, very exciting time it would be in any sport in a sort of a World Cup type competition and uh, obviously myself and Nigel Carr and Philip Rayleigh were driving down for a training session about a month before the World Cup and unfortunately at the, at the border which uh, doesn't really it, well the, the road that the bomb was on was, was the old road so you don't actually drive past it now when you're going north to south generally in the motorway but Clearly, we were caught up in a, a, the IRA, just a car bomb at the side of the road. And just as their so-called target, Judge Gibson and his wife, were, were passing this car, we happened to be passing and going in the opposite direction and clearly get caught up in, in, in the bomb explosion. And miraculously, none of us were killed. Um, and even myself, which I was closest to the bomb, which was on my side, I think... The hair in my head was singed badly. The hair in my right arm was singed, and I had a scrape in my nose, and that was it. Nigel Carr, unfortunately, had a lot more serious injuries. He was in the passenger seat beside me, and he had broken ribs, broken ankle, ruptured spleen, various, you know, quite a list of, of injuries, which unfortunately, in the end, kept him out and of the World Cup, and he missed it. Um, Philip Rainey was, was essentially okay as well, but one went to the World Cup, so it was a fairly traumatic incident. Clearly for us, and I think it, it suddenly opened the, the eyes of a lot of the guys in the squad generally, particularly the guys down south, because as I explained to the Irish team, you know, pre-France game, I said, look, it's a, it's a wee bit at the moment, like us watching all this stuff on, on the TV about Ukraine, you sort of look at it and you say, oh, that's terrible. Oh, God help them, blah de blah And back in the days of the Troubles, I'm sure probably that's, when people in the UK, people down south thought as well. They saw it on the news every night, unfortunately, and they thought that's terrible. But they didn't really know, you know, what it was like or or what effects it could have on people. So it was certainly an eye opener, I think, for a lot of them. And I was sort of pleasantly surprised that they took so much out of it and that it really seemed to affect them. And I was certainly quite relieved on the Saturday down at the French game to see them. And clearly, people have remarked about Johnny getting very emotional in, in, in the shoulder to shoulder but I think the whole team were and I think hopefully they can keep that going and uh, take it on in the, the Rugby World Cup this year and hopefully it'll pay dividends David I think I've heard you describe before the, that moment of the explosion as being like a like 100 flash bulbs or light bulbs going off at once um, and, and you mentioned uh uh, Morris Gibson, the senior judge, and his wife, uh, both of whom were killed sadly in this uh, five hundred pound yeah. bomb. Like, were you aware immediately how serious this explosion was? I think, in an unusual way, sometimes you always imagine certain situations in life that you, you obviously hope that you'll never be in. For example, being on a bomb. For example, falling out of a plane. What would it be like as you fall into the you know, that type of thing? It sounds a bit odd, but so. I mean, although I had heard lots of bombs going off, 
around Belfast and particularly the school I went to, uh, Belfast Dents, which is right in the middle of the city centre. I mean, during the Troubles, there's bombs going off nearly every day, I, some pretty close to the school. So the sound of a bomb going off, I was quite familiar with. And, and when it happened to us, I say, clearly, it, <clears throat> it just comes out of the blue. Obviously, you're not expecting it. So as I, as you described, you know, it was a huge amount of white light, uh, enormous noise. And in that split second time, as people always say, seemed to slow down. And I, and I remember thinking, there's a bomb under my car. Why has my car been blown up? I don't understand this. Clearly, I wasn't aware. As you're driving along, I probably wasn't really that aware of the car coming towards me, and I certainly wasn't aware of the car parked at the side of the road. We were just chatting about the World Cup that was coming up later that month. So it all happened clearly, as you would expect, very quickly. And, and within what was probably a second or two, my car had literally stopped still facing the same way, still in the same lane, as if I'd literally done an emergency stop. And it was only then that I sort of realized uh, when I looked to my right, I saw a huge crater in the road. And when I looked to my left, I saw obviously Nigel injured beside me, sort of semi-conscious. And through his window, I saw the other car, which was basically an inferno of flame internally. And two vague shadows in the front seat, which I initially thought was a police car. Clearly, I sort of checked myself over to make sure I didn't, I wasn't missing any limbs or any significant injuries. So it, it all basically happened very quickly. And then after that, there was sort of general chaos at the scene because obviously cars in front and behind both myself and the judge's car were sort of had veered off the road. I think there was three or four nurses from the south of Ireland who were traveling north, ironically, for the first time to some nurses' awards dinner. And they had veered off the road and they were sort of running around screaming. And, you know, it was just chaos at that point. But I suppose maybe with my medical background, I don't know. I just got into sort of. Uh, I suppose safety mode and, and, and started to proceed to try and get Nigel out of the car and Philip out of the car and, and I directed a, a lorry to go up the road to inform the police and blah blah blah. I, I didn't realise at that time that the guard of Shakona had escorted Judge Gibson to about 100 yards short of where the bomb was and the RUC were 100 yards up the road waiting to escort him the rest of the way so they were actually already there but observing from a distance because clearly, you may recall in those days, you know, a, a second bomb frequently could have been set to sort of booby trap any of the security forces. So it was a bit surreal and chaotic, certainly for at least 10 or 15 minutes straight afterwards. When do you come back to yourself and, and kind of start to realise that you've been through the experience where, where the immediate kind of medical training passes and you're like, OK, kind of need to start dealing with what's happened? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, obviously there was a, a probably a good hour or so after the bomb where, you know, Nigel and Philip went off to Dizzy Hill Hospital. I tried to sort my car out. I spoke to a few people. I rang my mom. I rang Wonders Rugby Club in Dublin to let them know clearly we wouldn't be there for training. Uh, yeah, I, Trevor Ringland, Hugo McNeil and Sid Miller were actually about maybe five minutes behind us on route south. <clears throat> and they were diverted around, not past the actual incident, but they were, like all the traffic, they were diverted through the countryside around the incident. They didn't know at that point that it was obviously us. So uh, clearly, i say we weren't going to trail in. I rang my brother, Alan. He came down and picked me up. The car was obviously destroyed. Uh, that was, I think that was... It was either Saturday morning or Sunday morning. I can't remember. I think it was maybe Sunday morning. Monday morning, I was back in my GP trainee post as normal, doing my normal job and just continued on in my normal way. And um, I think some maybe 15 years later, 20 years later, I was out in the town in Dublin with Rob Jones and Dean Richards, the English number eight after I think it was the Peace International that Trevor and Hugo McNeil had organized. And uh, we were out that night and they asked me something about it. Um, it 
it sort of just hit me then. So every now and again, it was sort of, it would just come to the surface. But generally, you know, I think I, I just look at it that we were very fortunate. Obviously, unfortunate to be in it in the first place, but fortunate to have come through it the way we did. And to say, obviously, that's why, you know, Brian wanted to take me back down to Colleen for the for the documentary, which is where we, we filmed the scene, literally where the bomb had been. So I think I've dealt with it okay, but sometimes you just have to get on and hope that things sort themselves out. I do. I do. I'm very interested in, in your perspective on this because I often wonder about the shared trauma and the ability for us now to process it. And maybe in the processing of it, we find some way to all be a little bit closer in our understanding of the possibilities for us as a, as a, as a country, you know, as, as people who share the island. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, an incident like that certainly opens up lots of doors of thought within your own head and other people's heads. And sometimes, hopefully, you know, a lot of people change their opinions then and sort of think, oh, that's terrible, that shouldn't happen. We need to do whatever we can to make sure it doesn't happen again, and so on, so on. I mean, I think at the time, obviously, probably more so sort of 70s, early 80s at the time, obviously, there was lots of incidents in the North. And I was one of, one of many just, or we were one of many. Um, but I think, you know, it was incidents like that and, and all the others that you know, ultimately led to, I suppose, people saying, like, we're fed up with this, something needs to be done. And obviously, you know, the Irish agreement sort of came in towards the end of the, end of the 90s eventually and so on and so on. And obviously since then, things have been relatively normal up here uh, compared to what they were. So, um as I say, I certainly found it, I suppose I found it therapeutic talking to the guys in Dublin. Uh, I think they equally find it uh, fascinating and hopefully motivating and whatever else other you, phrases you want to use for, for them, even though, as I say, some of them were maybe, maybe not even born at that time or from further afield, like, like Bundy and Mark Hansen and people like that. But it certainly made them think seriously about what it all meant in terms of them to the Jersey. I suppose that's why we're, we're speaking to you as well, David, is that tomorrow's the 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement. And, and as you say, a lot of p- young people nowadays of a certain generation won't be familiar with, with the Troubles whatsoever. They just weren't alive to, to experience it. Um, is that one of the reasons why you feel open and, I, I guess, compelled to, to speak about your experience as well of that incident in, in 87? Because... I guess that famous quote that's in Auschwitz as well, those who, who uh, cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And that's an important lesson for young people as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important for everybody nowadays, particularly people that didn't live through the troubles, to be aware of what happened and, and, and probably to be more aware of I suppose, why why the troubles happened. And as I said, when I, when I heard I was doing the talk, I did do a bit more reading up particularly about sort of our Irish history. And I mean, like like, like the history of old countries, it, it's quite complicated. And you, the further back you go, the more complicated it gets. And you think, well, who, who, who came from where and who legitimately owns this or should live there, do that or whatever. But at the end of the day, no matter where you're from or what part of the world you're in, people have to live together. And I think there's more important things in the world at the moment in terms of keeping the world itself going rather than, than, than conflict within certain countries or certain parts of certain countries. Um, uh, as I, you know, I keep talking about the, the movie Sliding Doors, particularly with regards to the incident at the border, you know, a couple of traffic lights here and there, a couple of things here and there, and we may not have been in the bomb, but it turned out that just the way things worked out, we were. And uh, as I say, it, it clearly changed my, pers- well, not changed my perspective, but I've been sort of experiencing the troubles for a lot of years, but it certainly changed the perspective of a lot of people, particularly down south within that sort of rugby setup. Yeah, I've no doubt. And uh, I, I can only imagine how difficult it is sometimes to talk about this. And you've been really good with your time this morning. Um, and it clearly had an impact on the players. And I think the fact that that had such an impact is continuing to ripple out as the conversation. We learned a bit more about what happened. And um, I know 
like uh, a lot of people in the room were kind of saying it was just for the room but then the players started to talk about it unprompted and that has kind of fed into this conversation about Ireland's call and um, and why we kind of need something to help us all yeah. bring it together yeah I mean I think um, that, as I say at the beginning there's probably a lot of people particularly down south and, you know who maybe certain different views or thought oh, why are we singing that song that, that's just to appease the ones from the north type thing but I think as time went on, and particularly more recently, you know, people sort of suddenly realise that it is actually very inclusive and it is very representative of, of the whole island of Ireland and the four provinces. And as I say, if you look at the words, they are quite motivational. I mean, fair play to Phil Coulter when he, when he wrote it. Uh, I mean, even when, when you sort of think, of, you know, come the day and come the hour, you know, that, that could be the World Cup final this year. You know, it's sort of... You can really, I mean, obviously, the Irish team are very, very uh, well prepared in most ways. But it's a fantastic team. Uh, and it's sometimes, you know, these be small motivational things. I mean, you just add that on to the top of all their other preparation and so on. It can make a difference and hopefully it will down the line. And, uh, I think certainly this year of all the years in the World Cup, Ireland, you know, they've, they've always gone into the World Cup with great hopes and, and, and tended to maybe fall a wee bit at the, not the first hurdle, but, at, you know, not progress as far as they should have. But, I mean, clearly there's pressure on them this year to, to do well as number one team in the world. It's incredible for a, for a country this size. But I think it it just shows you the, the, the power and the strength of the sort of uh, feeling within Ireland, particularly in sport, not just rugby. Gaelic, hockey, soccer, you know, boxing, you name it. I mean, we, we fight above our weight in, in a lot of things, particularly in sport. And hopefully, as I say, this year in the World Cup, they'll be able to uh, get out of a very, very difficult group and, and progress on in the competition and ultimately bring back the, the Holy Grail, as I say. Well, if that happens, you can definitely say that you played your bit, uh, David. It's been <laughs> fascinating listening to you. Thanks so much for yeah. being so generous with your time. No worries. It's uh, David Irwin there, um, former Ireland and uh, Lyon, uh, talking to us about talking to the team in the week of the France game. Um, so yeah, they can uh, definitely dip into the likes of that, can't they? Like maybe in September or for, like they'll they'll think back to the, the likes of those talks and take little bits from them because uh, it's just an incredible story. I, I don't know if some people watching would have heard heard of that story before. Some won't because Nigel Carr, like who was probably the most badly injured of the three lads like he was one of the best open sides in the world at the time like and, and didn't get to play in the World Cup later that year in 87 um, of course they were lucky to be alive at, at the end of it but it's just an incredible story and, and probably highlights why we're talking about it as well Good Friday Agreement 25 years on such an important moment in, in this country's history so really inspiring uh, individual David Irwin